So today we are talking to Stuart Chaffee. Hello, Stuart. Hello. And you are very much known for your computer show that you did um, for 20 years, right. kind of. That would be the Computer Chronicles. Yep. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you agreed for the interview. So thank you for that. Sure. Pleasure to talk with you. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, so. Would you start, please, in telling us a bit, how did you start to be a, um, a television presenter, actually? Oh, uh, well, that's a, a long story, but I'll try to make it short. Uh, let me see. Before the Computer Chronicles, I had done sort of general news work as a TV reporter. So I had been doing just TV journalism, covering all kinds of things uh, before Computer Chronicles ever started. And the fact is, I also happened to be a lawyer, so I was covering trials and doing legal stuff as a reporter also. And the technology part just came out of my own personal interest. As a, as a college undergraduate, I was a math major, so I've always been a sort of geeky kind of guy. And uh, when the PC revolution started, I thought, well, this is fun, so let's do a TV show about that. Okay. So uh, you said you are originally a lawyer, so you did law stuff for the television side of the law or something? Uh, a little bit of both. When I got out of law school, I actually went to work for an American news network here, ABC News in New York. Mm. And I covered general things, and then I actually worked in Europe. I worked in Paris for a while working for CBS News. And then I did some other things. I went to Los Angeles and actually produced courtroom television shows. And one thing led to another, and I eventually got into the technology field. Okay. So you, you said you started with it when you, when you saw the computer business takes off. Actually, the show starts at 983. Correct. So, so did, you any, did you do anything before the Computer Chronicles? Uh, no, not so. With actually, before the Computer Chronicles, you know, there was a local show in the San Francisco area in 1982. Mm. That, and uh, the history of that is kind of interesting. As you, if you can think back, I don't know, were you born in 1982? Yes, I'm born in 1982. <laughs> okay. Exactly. If you think back to that, that period of time when personal computers were just coming about, and we had, you know, TRS-80 and Apple II and that kind of stuff. There wasn't very much of a support system of information and knowledge for these computer users. It was all pretty much a you know a hacker's kind of kind of community. And as you well know, the big way you got information about what to do with all these new things was you joined a users group. And you went to a users group meeting every Thursday night at eight o'clock in some guy's basement and how did you see that thing and you figure out that gadget and how do you do this? And so my brainstorm was, well, instead of having a users group meeting where 20 guys sit around and drink beer, why don't we have a million people around the country, around the world, attend the same meeting? And that was the genesis of Computer Chronicles. I see. So this is how you got the idea, actually, to do the Computer Chronicles. Well, I mean, frankly, I did the show for myself. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was one of those guys that wanted to, there were no computer magazines at the time. Okay. I mean, the only way you get information was from some other guy who was smarter than you were. And so I, I, I was, I had bought my, I don't know, I guess my first computer was a Radio Shack TRS Model 80, I guess. And I had, I had bought a couple of computer kits and just sort of messed around. Uh, and I guess when I was looking for help and I found it through people I knew who knew more about the stuff than I did. I mean, I really wasn't a computer science guy. I was a math major, so I had an inclination, but I didn't know computer stuff that well. And uh, I just thought it would be a great idea to get smart people together in a room or in a studio and talk about the newest stuff and help guys like me figure out what was worth buying, what was worth spending your money on, and how you could fix problems. So the idea was actually to combine your computer hobby with your work. Exactly. This, this <laughs> the means, ideal situation. 
Yeah, that means you have your dream job, right. kind of. Right. Exactly. Interesting, interesting. Um, so yes, so I was watching past interviews, for yes. example, at the Triangle Show, and you mentioned that when you started the show, it was very hard to get people being interviewed and being guests in your show. You right. mentioned especially uh, Steve Jobs, <laughs> who was like, why should I support your show? Nobody knows you yet, it's kind of. So how did you get this off and starting so you could actually get the big guys for, for the show? Well, there were, two, there were two issues. One was getting the big guys to pay for the show. The other was getting the smart guys to be on the show as guests. So they were both challenges. When we first started out, people said, who's going to watch a television show about computers? You know, no, nobody thought this was, this, this was going to work. So, uh, yeah, when we first started out, we had to obviously, as I say, it was a local show with no budget for the first year. Mm. And it was kind of interesting. I might have explained this on the triangulation show, but, you know, we didn't do anything to promote this show. But even at the time, back in 1982, you know, there were still guys on the network talking to each other. And uh, people just started saying, you know, hey, there's a show in San Francisco that actually explained this stuff. And I started literally getting phone calls in my office saying, can we get this show in Buffalo, New York? And can we get this show in Cleveland, Ohio? And by just answering the phone, you know, like 30 television stations around the country took the show. And we said, oh, I guess this is a good idea after all. And that's when we started to try to raise some money and do it the next year as as a proper national show with, with higher production value. Well, what, what we should mention here is that at the time you started, it was still like everybody was afraid of touching a computer, being afraid he could break it or something. Yes, absolutely. Well, because in those days, you had to take it apart, right? I mean, you were putting in boards and throwing dip switches and trying to figure that it wasn't easy. I mean, nowadays, it's like a refrigerator. You just turned it on. But uh, in the early days, you really had to know what you were doing. Now, you probably couldn't have broken too much, but if things were so expensive in the early days, you didn't want to take a chance on breaking something. I mean, you know, computers we can buy for here in the States for eight, nine hundred dollars today were five thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, that's or, true. Or, or. That's true. Yes, well, and um, well, the other interesting thing is I read actually by the 20 years you had over uh, 300 American channels podcasting the show. At least Wikipedia said that. Well, by the, yeah, by the time we were into our last couple of years, there were actually about 250 stations in the United States, and the show was also on around the world in 100 different countries. We, yeah. there's, a, there's a French German, a French version of the show, a Spanish version of the show, an Arabic version of the show. Yeah, and, and, um, and Chinese too, actually, I read. Uh, that wasn't official, but some people on their own did translations of it in China. Ah, ah, right. Interesting, interesting. So you, we could say you are internationally famous. Uh, just, it just, we didn't try it, but it just turned out that way. I'm always amazed when I go into other countries and people say, Oh, you're the guy from the Computer Chronicles. And I had no idea the show was even on in their country. But it's pretty fascinating. I mean, from Africa to Europe to Asia. Uh, yeah, it really became a phenomenon as we, as we sort of promoted it at the time, it really was the world's most popular television show about computers. What was interesting me is, how did you actually get the knowledge? I mean, I was watching um, tons of shows from the Computer Chronicles, and I actually figured out that when you interviewed people, it, it, there was always the impression that you knew what they are going to talk about, and you had the technical deck background, but back in the 80s, something you didn't have internet. What did you do right. to get some background knowledge to make sure that guests don't tell you crap? Right. Well, that was a big issue. Uh, a couple of reasons. I mean, I wasn't. I didn't do the show all by myself. We had a staff, mm -hmm. and each show would have what we called a segment producer, and that segment producer would spend a week or two researching the topic for that show. So, and they would then provide me what we used to call a briefing paper, maybe a 10 or 20 page. Uh, thesis, you know, on the particular subject of that show, which I would then study and read. And then I would meet with the guests ahead of time. So I sort of could anticipate what they were going to do. And, and again, we were dealing a lot of times with this cutting edge technology, which half the time didn't work. So uh, I not only had to understand the subject, but understand how to deal with the problems when things didn't work and they failed. And this was sort of, you know, this is kind of what we call live on television. It was really live television. 
So uh, we didn't want too many embarrassing moments, and there were you know time restraints. We would only have four or five minutes with a guest or with a product. So uh, yeah, we we had to do our homework, or the show would have been very boring. <laughs> so what was the first guest you had, and what was what was the first big thing you introduced to the show? Do you still remember that? Well, we did over 600 shows, so it'll take a little bit of memory. The, the first season actually was interesting. The first season, I, I do remember the very first show we did, it was called From Mainframes to Minis to Micros. And it looked at the whole evolution of how we got to the personal computer from those big monster things that used to take up all that space before. And um, the, the first 26 shows of the series actually got uh, repurposed and became a a course, a college course on introduction to computers. <clears throat> In fact, I don't know, probably most people don't know, there's actually a book called Computer Chronicles, uh, which was written by a guy named Herb Lechner, who worked for SRI in the Silicon Valley, that really had a chapter that explained each of those first 26 shows. So the first year was really a lot of, a lot of the basics of people who didn't know much about computers. I could, I could actually pull up, I have a whole list on my computer, I could pull it up and tell you, hold on one second, I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's that see. Would be awesome. I have it. I have it right here. Um, the very first show we did. <clears throat> yeah, mainframes to minis to micros. The next show was integrated software. Third show was computers and music. The fourth show was computer simulations. Fifth show was an operating systems. We got word processing, security, robotics, speech, networking. Microprocessors, on and on and on. So. I see, I see. Um, so through all these years, uh, what was your most memor memorable uh, moment? What was the best show? What was the best guest? I mean, what what did you impress you the most from all what you have seen? Well, there are things that impressed me a lot and things that didn't impress me a lot. It's the things that didn't impress that were kind of more interesting in a way. I guess. The most impressive thing, I guess, early on was when I saw the first color laser printer. Xerox was that, right? Xerox, right. Yeah. Uh, as I, I, you might, might have heard the story before, but it was, it was a rather funny story. I mean, these guys came in with, a size, it was, the printer was the size of two Volkswagens, and it was gigantic. And there was like six engineers came along to plug it in and hook it up and tweak it and tweak it and try to get it working. And when they first turned it on, just steam came up and nothing happened, just sort of blew up. But eventually they got it working and the output was incredible. It was the most gorgeous thing I'd ever seen coming out of I me. Mean, you know, that way back then, you, you were looking at dot matrix printers. This thing pr printed out this gorgeous color photo on high res. It was extraordinary. That was one of the most exciting things in terms of hardware that I saw. Uh, the, the funny things were that so many things have just have never really gotten better, like uh, speech recognition, uh, uh, what else I'd say, artificial intelligence stuff, um, virtual reality stuff. I mean, our crew, and if I told our crew we're doing a show on, on MIDI music, they oh my God, because we're going to be here all night long because the stuff never work. You know? We're doing a show on virtual reality, oh my God, we're going to be here until midnight. You know? So a lot, a lot of things didn't, didn't work first time around. Um, but the other... Yeah, I'd say that color printer was the most amazing thing I had seen at the time. Um, after that, I guess a lot of the sort of productivity tools we did uh, were pretty fascinating. I mean, computers were fun, but every once in a while we'd come across an application category that really solved a problem and changed the way you did things. Um, and I was particularly fascinated by, you know, artificial intelligence and intelligent systems and things like that. But they it never really got very far. But on the other hand, things like um, Siri, for example, got pretty famous like three years ago with the iPhone 4. And, and people are fascinated by how well the speak, speech recognition actually works. And you just told me it didn't really improve. So how does this fit? Well, I mean, it's been 30 years. So yes, it's improved a bit. But still, there's a lot of frustrated Siri users. <laughs> uh, I mean, and I'm one of them. I mean sort of works, but I mean, it's obviously gotten a lot better. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking about sort, sort of the period of the 20 years when we were doing the show, not a lot of things changed. Hmm. Uh, you know, we, a, a, every year somebody would come on and show us, you know, uh, talking to your computer instead of typing it. 
and, and, and just never worked. I mean, if the guy really practiced and he knew, and, the, and they did the same 20 sentences every time, it worked. But I mean, it took a long time for that. And then it's, it's, still, it's still a challenge, obviously. I mean, to me, the most interesting challenge that still exists in general between humans and computers is that interface. Mm. I mean, you know, QWERTY keyboards, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous in a way when you think about it. I mean, ultimately, we should be able to get the speech and all that, all that kind of stuff. But it ha and you think of the early uh, PDAs like the Newton with, you know, mm. handwriting inside. I mean, none of that stuff really worked. But what this brain does is pretty hard to emulate. <laughs> That's true, actually. Um, on the other hand, I find it always fascinating how you were actually able to get things interesting that were that were um, supposed to be boring at the time right. back then. For example, I saw the show where you had David Crane on the on the show for the right. Ghostbusters game. You know, right. Ghostbusters was out. I guess that was eighty eighty four or eighty three right, or something. Right, early, yeah. And and back then, people thought, oh, computers are just for working, not for having fun and kind right. of. And as you know, David Crane was like one of those guys who, sure. who, who made Activision and being the first third part um, uh, game uh, producer. Uh, yeah. And I found it fascinating how you managed to make the Ghostbusters show actually kind of interesting for, for the viewers. Right. Uh, didn't, didn't, you, didn't you think while you interviewed the people like, oh, this, this must be kind of boring for the, for the people who watch it? And, and you try hard to make it exciting? I definitely try hard to make it exciting. Well, I mean, it's, it depends. Some things are rather easy. I mean, certainly if you're doing games, I mean, that's sort of easy to do. What I found fascinating about that period of time, I'm trying to remember the name of the piece of software. I don't remember the guy. Just around that time, we had another guy on. Don't know if it was Activision or not. I think it was some, somebody else. That, and the, you know, you remember the memory size limits we had at that time. I mean, yeah, programs had to be kilobyte yeah. kind of yeah. programs had to be tiny. And this guy had written this space shuttle program. I don't remember what a computer was for. It might have been for the Amiga. I don't remember. And I still have the program. I mean, it's unbelievable what this guy squeezed into that space. I mean, that was one of the most spectacular things from a software point of view I ever saw. It was just brilliant, brilliant coding. So if you look if you look from it now, did you ever think that computers and um, video games would have gone so far as as they are now? Games industry is quite big. It's bigger than the movies industry nowadays. Yes. For example. I did, frankly, because uh, you know I was not a not a nut, but pretty big video game fan, and especially simulations where you could do things on a computer you just couldn't do in real life and to me that was absolutely fascinating that I mean it, it was like being in the movies I mean you could interact with things and, and do activities that in the real world you couldn't do or you would risk your life by doing it in the real world whereas on a computer you could sort of try anything out so I was pretty much fascinated I mean I love the early adventure games uh, any of those kinds of things where you could really you know live in another world and interact with, with things and people and characters. Uh, I always thought that was one of the most exciting things. That, that It really created a, a new reality. I mean, the reality before computers and video games was you and me, people, and, you know, normal human beings with flesh. All of a sudden, you could interact and have fun and play and be challenged and compete with things inside your computer. I, I still think it's fantastic. I mean, of course, nowadays with, with uh, phone apps, I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. So how did you decide who to get for the shows? Well, it was a pretty regular process for that. As I say, we had a, a, each show had a segment producer who was assigned to that show mm. two weeks before we actually did the show. Uh, they would go out. The, 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 the thought of the show was it was pretty complicated to be a computer consumer at that time. Everybody was telling you their thing was the greatest. <laughs> and you had to make a decision as to where to spend your money and what to guess was going to work and what wasn't going to work. And it was... It was pretty burdensome. So my, I considered our job to be to do all the hard work, to do all the leg work. It's like going to a trade show and visiting a hundred booths and a hundred things. Like, we saw four or five really cool ones and that's the ones we put on the show. So we literally would go do the leg work, the shopping, the hard work that most normal people don't have time to do or may not have the knowledge to do it uh, effectively. 
And then uh, the segment producer would come to me after doing that research and say, you know, of the 25 things out there, I think these are eight of the most interesting. And we would then have a meeting on our staff. And I'd look at them and say, well, that's boring, and that's interesting, and that's boring, and that's interesting. Let's do these four, five, or six. And we just made our best guesses. So after all, you got a budget for the show, because at the beginning you said you didn't have a budget. So you need a budget, after all, to buy well, all this stuff. The, but first, the first year when we did this as a local show, it really was a hobby. Nobody got paid anything. It was just, luckily, I happened to be running a TV station at the time, so I had control of a TV studio. So I could make the decision, we're going to do this. Okay. It didn't really cost anything. Okay. Uh, after that, when we went on a national and international basis, uh, and we had to really staff it up a little bit more, then, then that did take money, and we had to, you know, it became a business at that point. Mm. Okay. And an interesting business because, I don't know if you know the model, where it started in public television in the, in the United States, where we gave the show away for free to stations. They, they didn't pay for it. Okay. It was a sort of basically a kind of barter arrangement. We would then sell sponsors in the show, and the stations would then allow us to use their airtime to promote the sponsors. So it was a very odd business model. Okay. So we basically gave away the show. We never charged anybody for computer chronicles. Okay, but you got money from uh, you got at, at the end you got money for for the show in a way. Well, from yeah, the well, promotions. But... And stuff? Well, no, that, that wasn't promotion. The, the game was, by the time the show was on the air a year or two, we had a million viewers watching every week. Okay. And that's a pretty valuable asset if you're a company with a computer product. And just from a business point of view, people could buy advertising on television for the latest computer gadget, but two-thirds of the people watching television were never going to be interested in that product. They were just there to be entertained. But the advertisers knew people who watched my show were there for one reason, and that's to be told what's good. <laughs> and so it was a very effective advertising tool. So we could say that Computer Chronicles is the reason why the public got interest in the computers as well. To a large degree, I think that's why uh, people, who, as you mentioned, who might have thought it was boring by actually watching what we tried to make interesting and actually demonstrate, we didn't just talk about things, we demonstrated everything. And, and hopefully people would find that interesting, and obviously we weren't the only ones, but the thing I loved about doing our show, I mean, after a couple of years, of course, there were computer magazines. But you can read about a piece of software, you can read about an application, you can, not the same thing as seeing it. And on television, you could see it. You could actually see it run from here to here to here. And I thought that was a very impressive way to show off this technology, which to me was much more fun and much more valuable than reading about it in a magazine. Great, great. So, um, for example, like the Ghostbusters game or the Cirque Sprinter. Um, well, so, if I understood correctly, first, the first thing was to, to give the show away for free and to go to booth and kind of. But I think there was probably a turning point where CEOs and the big guys from the company actually asked you to be on exactly. the show. Good, good point. Yeah, so going back to the question you asked a little while ago, I mean, when we started out, nobody had ever heard of us, and everybody thought it was the dumbest idea in the world. So we would have to plead with people, oh, we're doing this television show called Computer Chronicles, and you think you could come to us? And fortunately, we were in the Silicon Valley, so we had access to a lot of people. But, you know, it was people eventually came from all over the country, all over the world. And so we would have to plead with people to come onto the show. After a year or two, I think the industry started to understand this is pretty valuable to be on the Computer Chronicles because a million people get to see your product. So it kind of switched around, and now we were answering the phone from PR people all over the country saying, oh, can we get our guy on your show? Can we get our new thing on your show? And this is really cool. And can, you know, So it, really, it was kind of exciting to watch that flip. But you, you also had probably put a lot of people down in a way, right? Uh, of course. I mean, well, not only did we let people down if we didn't get them on the show, Uh, the biggest problem was people would come on the show, and a lot of times we get these executives. Well, two interesting problems. We get the executive from a computer company. Number one, generally, they didn't know anything about the product. You know, <laughs> they'd have to bring some little techie who was hiding behind them and pressing the buttons because they didn't really know how to run the technology. That was one problem. The next problem, these people were used to being at trade shows and being booths where they had a, a, a pre-written spiel. You know, Here's the way I, you know, I spent 20 minutes and I explained the product. And I constantly, that's why people used to criticize me, because I was constantly interrupting these guys, saying, no, that's not what we want. I want the straight stuff. I don't want your pitch. 
it's we're not at a trade show right now. We've got a million normal people who want the child to hear the truth about what this thing can do and what it can't do. So we disappointed a lot of people by not letting them do it the way they wanted to do it, the way they were used to doing it. So yeah, there were there, there were two issues there. But you couldn't always avoid it. In some shows, you can clearly hear that people were speaking like on a teleshopping show. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I would try my best, but you know, it was the real world. We all had so much time, and we we some, sometimes we do a segment two or three times, and sometimes. You know, face it, some guy who was the marketing director of XYZ Computer Company just flown 3,000 miles, come to our studio, taken two days off from work, brought some assist. I mean, they, they had make a big invest made a big investment on being on the show, and they wanted to get a return on their investment, basically. And that's not what I wanted. I wanted mm. my audience to be enlightened. Mm. And not necessarily the same thing. I'm sure I'm sure one of the most watched shows on YouTube and kind of is the show where you had Jack Tremel on the show. Oh yes. <laughs> so what was your experience with him? Because it's known that he never did a lot of interviews. Right. Um, because he always he always said in the few interviews that he did that a couple of media people quoted him wrong and he got right. pissed by that and said no I don't want interviews anymore so how was it for you to have him in the in the studio and to talk to him actually well it was pretty exciting number one I mean Jack Tramiel was a legend you know from my point of view I was a big Commodore fan uh, I, I still have a couple of Amigas right here in my office <laughs> and uh, so it was very very exciting for me to meet him I was lucky we got to meet him through Gary Kildall As you may know, Gary, who was my co-host in the first 10 years or so, had worked with uh, Jack Tremiel on some of his early uh, optical uh, gadgets that he was working on. So it was through Gary that talked Jack into coming onto the show. And I think Jack's son Sam was on the show too, as I recall. Uh, and yeah, it was really thanks to Gary Kildall that, that he agreed to do that. And he felt a little more comfortable because Gary was going to be there and he knew Gary. So I wasn't just some other journalist who was going to be stupid. And he felt with Gary there, there was a little, you know, some credibility. And if all else failed, he could just talk to Gary instead of me. Uh, he was an interesting, he was very interesting. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. I just had a meeting a week ago with some people who are putting together a movie on the life of Jack Tremel. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's quite, quite an interesting story. And I found he was interesting because he wasn't a Silicon Valley guy. I mean, everybody else we dealt with, they were sort of the same. <clears throat> you know, it was a sort of young techie type guy. This was an older European businessman, bottom line guy, who just had, you know, was able to see the future and realize that, hey, this personal computer thing is going to be big, a lot more interesting than, than calculators or adding machines, whatever he was doing originally. Uh, yeah, that was quite an exciting thing for me to, uh, to meet Jack. Um, it's a very, very, very interesting character and not, not, not easy to deal with, but it was all thanks to Gary Kildall's intervention there. That's actually what a lot of um, Commodoreans told me that, that we interviewed, that he was sometimes not easy to handle. No. Um, and what well, he was, a, he was, he was frankly, he was a no bullshit kind of guy. <laughs> and, you know, you know in, in this world, I mean, everybody's always doing PR, 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 and nice, 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 but not telling the truth. <laughs> he was a truth guy. So, you know, you had to get right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think, but it's just my guess. I guess um, Jack knew Gary because of the CPM deal they did, kind of? Or how did they uh, know each other? I don't think it was so much the CPM deal, but you know, when Gary, Gary got very much into the early uh, Laserdisc stuff mm. and optical storage stuff. And I believe, I don't remember all the details. Matter of fact, one of my prized possessions is the very first digital optical encyclopedia. Gary made a deal with. Compton's, I think it was at the time, to actually take their entire encyclopedia and digitize it and put it on a disc. <clears throat> at the time, we didn't have DVDs and you know the CD-ROMs didn't have enough space, so he put it on a laser disc. <laughs> so there's you know this old-fashioned huge 10 inch or whatever is laser disc as the searchable, the first searchable digital encyclopedia. And actually, to Jack Trammell's credit, he saw the he was interested in this. They first started together. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was but Gary was doing some really interesting work in, in, in optical storage stuff uh, and that's when he and Jack first connected I believe mm. okay well, they actually knew each other from business apart from yes. the show yeah. okay yeah. and um, then they were an 
pair, by the way, because they were total opposites. Gary was all intelligent, coder, scientist type guy. Jack was all business kind of guy. So they completely complimented each other. I don't know how they ever had a conversation, but it was a, as, a, as a team, they were a great team because they did exactly, each one did for the other what the other didn't have. Looking back at the episodes you did, weren't you concerned that you are a bit biased because you were promoting Gary's inventions and stuff in your show at some point? No, I think it was just the opposite, in fact. I mean, what Gary had done, obviously, at that time was really a very small piece of the market. Uh, Gary sort of kept us honest. I mean, you know, Gary, you know, you know the whole long story about Gary and Microsoft and Bill Gates and all, all that stuff. Um, every time I'd say, we're going to do this thing for Microsoft, wait a minute, I've got a better version of that. DRI is working on this thing, which is way better than Windows. It's way better than this. It's way better than this. So I was always fighting, Gary was always fighting with me. If you're going to show that, you've got to show my thing. So, okay. uh, but, you know, he had, uh, what was his, uh, his operating system called? Um, CPM? Or do you mean that? No, not, no was that not CPM, but his visual environment. Uh, well, we he could. came up with something before Windows. It was competing with Windows, basically, and competing with the Mac. Graphical, Jim, graphical user, you, graphical environment manager. It was called Jim. That was a Gary digital research product. And in some ways, it, was, it could do things that Windows and the Mac couldn't do at the time. So he was very competitive in that sense. And so I don't really feel we promoted Gary's stuff too much. But to keep Gary smiling and happy, I mean, we had to give him a little bit of space to say, hey, I did something that's better than what Microsoft is doing. Or I'm doing something better than what Apple is doing. Just let people see it. Mm. I see. I see. Well, so interesting thing is, after all, you did this for 20 years. Right. Did you, did you never, um, I mean, did you, did you ever think it would come to an end? And the big question is, why did it actually end in 2002? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, if you may recall, around 2002 was a really slump in the economy in the Silicon Valley. Business was, had become very, very bad. It was the, the dot-com bust and lots of companies raise money, we're going out of business. It frankly became very hard financially to support the show after 20 years mm. uh, because the economy wasn't so good in the computer industry. That was number one. Number two, computers had become so commonplace that what our strength, explaining complicated things, wasn't such a strength anymore because things weren't that complicated anymore. You, you went to the store, bought a computer from Best Buy and and that's all I had to know. So sort of the, a lot of the things that the show was valuable for weren't quite as valuable later on. Uh, we had to get a little more gadget oriented. Uh, the third thing was I was tired. You know, doing a show every single week for 20 years, uh, I just needed a break. Seriously? The final thing is the industry did get a little boring at that time. You know, in the first 20 years, I mean, every week there was innovation. But, you know, as there was more mergers and Microsoft took over everything and Apple took over everything, a lot of little guys just disappeared. And it really wasn't the same sort of exciting uh, Wild West uh, environment mm. that it was for those first 20 years. So I think all those things added together said, I think I got to take a break. Mm. Do you think the Internet is the reason? Because around that time, Internet was like DSL, digital yes. subscriber line here in Europe. Everybody got a DS, DSL line, which was 780, uh, 768 kilobits per second. Right, right. Still horrible slow, but compared to modem, it was awesome. Right. So, and p do you think it it has to do with the internet? People could look everything up. They didn't. They didn't need computer shows anymore. Uh, I think that's a little bit of it. I, I think the trouble is, I think the economics of the internet at the time didn't allow people to do what we were doing in terms of the high production value and bringing in the top people from around the country uh, to talk about things. I mean, there were, at, you know, today, as you know, there's probably 500 Computer Chronicles clones online. But this, you know, so this is one guy sitting in his basement, you know, talking for 20 minutes about something. Uh, nobody ever quite was able to duplicate, I think, what we did. But there's no question about it. It became a lot easier to access information. Uh, and the demand for that information was less than it was 
I mean, the first 20 years when we started out. We also did other, other things that were unique. I mean, as you may know, we traveled around the world, went to major conferences in different countries and different continents and so on. Uh, and, you know, nobody doing a website really had the resources to do that. But yeah, you do make a good point. The, I don't think the, I, I think when we quit in 2002, I don't think the Internet was a big factor. The Internet was a big factor, I think, and why I didn't right away bring it back. Because the competition now is quite different than it had been originally. Mm. And if you had the offer to bring it back, would you actually do that? Absolutely. <laughs> so, so I just was in a con I was just was in a conversation before our little Skype conference here uh, with someone talking about that. And the amazing thing is to me, you know, the show's been off the air for what 10, 12 years or something now, but it's online everywhere. <laughs> I get emails every single day. From people who watch it on, online, I get what amazes me. I get emails from 13-year-old kids. <laughs> say, this is cool. This is so fascinating to see this old stuff. And we're, why the hell are they interested in this stuff? Yeah. So it's it's uh, yeah. I I think enough has changed now. I mean, the whole mobile world, mm. uh, the whole apps world, uh, the whole wireless world. Uh, I think there's uh, things are a little more exciting now. I think I. Uh, We're thinking about bringing it back. And, I, and frankly, I mean, I get an email a day saying, oh, why don't you bring that show back? Mm. Well, it would definitely be great to have it back. And that leads me to another, another interesting question. We interviewed so many people in the last two years, even people like Ralph Baer, who is known as the father of video gaming, who is 92 right. at the moment, and he's still active inventing electronic toys. Sure. And I wonder... Um, Because I figured a lot of people from the pioneer days, they never stopped. Right. Did you ever consider stopping what you are doing right now? Or will you be one of those dinosaurs who will, <laughs> he will do this forever? Well, I certainly did stop. I mean, I, ch I changed some of the things I've been, I mean, I've always been doing television or journalism in some form or another, even after Computer Chronicles, mm. uh, but not always, not always in the technology field anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean frankly, I, I, I get so many requests from people say, you know, bring back the show. And you know, it's sort of a compliment that people, you know, think that's a good idea, especially as you say, with all the internet stuff out there these days. Uh, But it's, you know, it's an expensive thing to do. But if we could, as I say, we're just literally talking about that right now. Uh, but, I mean, I still get these love letters from fans, from viewers, saying, oh, it's the greatest show ever, and, you know, why, do, why, do, why don't you bring it back? It's not so fun. So it would be fun, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm not that old that I can't do it. <laughs> so do we have to cut this out, or is this not such a big of a secret, actually, that you want to bring it out? Uh, not a secret at all. Okay, so we can leave. No, it. no, 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 not a secret. Um, I haven't done anything to actively promote it mm. because, frankly, we're in the in the stage of trying to find the money for it right now mm. because it's a lot more expensive to do now than it was ten years Big ago. Kickstarter. <laughs> we've we've talked about that. <laughs> we've talked about Kickstarter. I know. Um, we're, we're thinking about that. I mean, that's one option. <laughs> so matter of fact, I've. We've actually always d already put some work together, putting together a Kickstarter campaign. We haven't pulled the trigger yet. So I guess that means the answer to my question is no, you're not planning to stop. If you had the offer, you would go and continue the show. Uh, if we could put the right, the right model together with the right kind of uh, sponsor support, hmm. uh, and I had the right support, supporting team to do it, uh, sure, I'd do it in a minute, absolutely. Hmm. It was great fun. I loved hmm. it. It, 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 you know, it kept me on top of the world in terms of all, knowing all the newest things and all the sharpest things. And as I say, basically, I was very selfish. I did the show for me. I was the audience. And if anybody else wanted to watch, good for them. So, I mean, I wanted to know all the newest stuff. I wanted to know what worked and what didn't. I still do. Okay. Okay. And if you do a television show, it's a pretty good way to do that. So, um, that leads me to another question. Why yeah. do you think that is that pioneers like yourself or the people you interviewed, they are very often um, still going on this development. For example, Shaq Paddle, who did the pet thing, he's nowadays right. working on the successor of the solid state disc. Yeah? Right. With 76 and anybody else would say, go and retire. Why are you still right. working on that? So why do you think that, what, what do you think the reason for that is, that people still will go on? Because it's a certain kind of high, and you don't have to pay for drugs. 
I mean, in inventing things, developing things, seeing that process is very, very exciting, whether it's a piece of technology or software or a television show. I mean, that's, that becomes an addictive. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about that once. We were in the studio. Uh, so I was doing sort of general news at the time, but we were planning a show. And, you know, it's, television production is pretty high-pressure activity. And actually, in another show I was doing, it had nothing to do with technology, we were doing a show about uh, workers on taking drugs on, at the workplace. Ooh. So we had hired a drug tester guy to come into the studio who's going to work with us on this project. So before we went out to the workplace, he said, look, I want to calibrate my meters. So I'm going to set up in the studio. Could you send a couple of people from your staff in here? I just want to check them to see if my meters are fine. Fine. So about four or five people went in there. Afterwards, he said, I walked in the office and said, I want to tell you something. Your staff is high. Your staff is on drugs. I said, no, they're not. They just love what they do. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So it, It's a high. I mean, you, I'm sure you know it yourself. I mean, there, there's nothing like... I mean, I'm, I mean I'm, an, I'm an idiot, but I mean, I do, I've done a teeny little bit of programming. Next thing you know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you're still there, right? <laughs> nothing like that. <laughs> yes, but um, the problem is really to get people supporting what you're doing. And, um, but, in, but in my case, doing the zine world, it's helped a lot that the retro hype is happening since the last four years. Everybody yeah. is going back to the 80s and 90s and says, wow, that was a fun time. Exactly, um, it was, it was. So people actually go on eBay and buy the old computer rather than, than using emulators to experience yes. Yes. the hardware and stuff? Yeah, no, there, there was a certain excitement and fascinating to those first 20, 25 years. Uh, that said, by comparison, it's pretty boring these days. And there's been, there's been so much consolidation in the industry. I mean, in the early days, as you know, I mean, there are hundreds of little companies doing this and doing that. It was really fun to, uh, to watch. Uh, it's, it's become so much more corporate. It's not quite as much fun as it was. And even, I mean, even the startup things, the Facebooks, I mean, they're, they're monster mm. international operations now, even though it feels small. So let's assume that the show goes on because they say show must go on if you, okay. if you find out the money for it. Um, how would, how would uh, the Computer Chronicles be nowadays? How would it change? That's a really good question. Certainly the things, the subject and the topics we cover would be different. Uh, we've thought a lot about whether we would stick to the same model we had, which is sort of, you know, building a kind of workshop in the studio and bringing people into us versus going out on the field and doing more of it on location. There's some financial factors there and what it costs to do those two kinds of shows. I don't think it would necessarily change a lot. The subject matter would change. Mm. I mean, obviously, what was exciting 10 years ago is not exciting today. Today, it's all about mobile. Uh, it's all about apps. It's all about wireless. It's all about the whole change in the media field, uh, the, the challenge of, the, as you were pointing out, the Internet to traditional uh, media. So th things are quite different now, but there's still, still a lot of stuff out there. But, but, but I, as we've actually thought about bringing back the show, we thought, you know, can we really sustain this for 52 weeks a year? Is, you know, is, is that much fun happening that's new and different from our, the way we do things, which is really to demonstrate, not just talk, uh, to do that? And we went through it, and I think, I think we could do it, yeah. Um, um, I definitely think it's possible. I mean, I was having a three hours conversation with Sherry Ellsworth, who is doing argumented reality, and that whole right. argumented reality topic Ate it up like ate up like two hours of the interview. But that stuff is so great. That stuff is hard to do on television, but it's fascinating. So I definitely think it would be possible. Of course, you would you would have you would have uh, probably a change somewhere that you have an iPhone app and streaming of the show online, which oh, you didn't oh, well, have well, back that, then. That's the big change. I mean, at the time when we took the show off the air, I mean, I was publish, publishing a print newsletter. I mean, we didn't have the tools then that we have now in terms of social media, in terms of apps and so on. Uh, now it would be a multi-platform show. It wouldn't just be a television show. Mm. And we'd break up the show into bite-sized chunks that would always be on the web and be on you know, smartphones. It sort of be, could be totally different. Actually, I read you are the reason why almost all episodes of the show are on, uh, on the archive.org. Right. Tell us a bit about that, that story. 
Well, that's a very interesting story, too, actually. We, I, I don't know if you know, the second show we did called Net Cafe. So in addition to Computer Chronic, for six years, we did a show that was just about the Internet and the web. And that was a very different show. That was a show on location in Internet cafes in different places. I saw that. Quite, quite noisy at times. Actually. Yes, that's true. Well, <laughs> that's the price you pay. But it had a nice... I got that idea, basically, because here in the... Not here, but in the Bay Area... There was a guy who ran a, a, an Amiga store, and it, it, it was sort of became a user's group thing. You'd walk in that store, just guys would come from all over the Bay Area to talk to each other and see what was new. And I thought, this is, this is kind of fun. I want to bring a camera into one of these sort of gatherings. And that's where the idea of Net Cafe came out. It was really bring a camera into an Internet cafe where people would play around with these things. And, you know, and those Internet cafes sort of didn't didn't last, but at the time was a very exciting model. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the question though. The question was how did you actually succeed on bring it on on archive.org? Ah, uh, right, right. So, okay, so I was doing, we were doing a net cafe show and one of the subjects on the show was Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine. Exactly, that's so, the name of I it. I was yeah. interviewing Brewster Kale, who was the inventor, the guy who founded the Internet Archive and whose idea was the Wayback Machine. So we had finished the interview and finished the TV show, and we were just sitting around uh, in this internet cafe, wherever was talking after the show. And he was telling me what they were trying to do. And at the time, they were focused on basically archiving web pages. That was it. They had a couple other little, you know, that an audio, a music collection. That was pretty much it. And I said, you know, I have an interesting archiving kind of problem. I have hundreds of hours of the whole history of the personal computer revolution on video sitting on shelves. And nobody can access it. He said, let's talk about that. He said, suppose I agreed to pay to digitize all your shows and put them online. Would you agree to make them available for free to anybody who wanted them? I said, you got a deal. And that's how it all started. And we, it, was a, it took like two years. I mean, I say we had about 600 shows or something. And so we took all those shows. And the technology wasn't as swift then as it is now. Hmm. And made digital copies of all those analog videotapes and slowly 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 got them all online that's how it started and I thought it would be kind of pretty small little thing but to this day I mean certain shows one of them the Commodore show uh, are downloaded tens of thousands of times a week I mean it's astonishing to me. so after all so that's how that was it was quite by, quite by accident and through the good graces of the archive and understood the value of this and that frankly led to them doing a lot more of this, and I'll tell you something else which most people don't know about. So I actually then went to work with the archive to help other people do what we had done with the content that I owned. And the Internet Archive was the original YouTube. Wow, okay. It was the first site that offered free hosting to anybody who wanted to put anything they wanted up online. But we never, we were a nonprofit. Hmm. We, weren't we weren't running it as a business. And frankly, the people at the company at the time <clears throat> didn't see what the business was. How are you going to make money just hosting all these videos and we had no, no limit on it? And basically, the YouTube guys stole our idea and put a better front end and a better user interface. Oh. Uh, but we were really the first YouTube at Internet Archive. And I bet most people don't know that. Nobody <laughs> knows that. Wow. So that's the first. And... Um, and, uh, and uh, YouTube started, you know, down the street from where I live in the Silicon Valley. Wow. And we had talked to them originally because they never imagined YouTube would become what it was. We had all this old stuff. They were working on new stuff. They wanted to make a partnership with us where they would put up current stuff, but we would be responsible for keeping this stuff around forever. <clears throat> At the time, of course, storage was a lot more expensive than it is right now, and bandwidth is more expensive than it is mm. right now. But, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a, a long, sad story, us and YouTube. And the, the also the interesting thing is the archives of the Wayback Machine seems to be outside of this Copyright Act problem because they are also hosting the MAME ROMs, you know, the emulator ROMs for Arcade right. games, like right. I have one behind my back. Right. Um, actually, they, they were allowed to, to, to host all those ROM files for the, for the arcade games. Which yes. is considered illegal if you don't know if you don't own the original board, kind of. Right. Do you have an idea how right. that happened? I actually worked actually? on that for a while. 
Um, well, the good news is the archive is a nonprofit, so mm. it's not a money-making for-profit organization. So there were little exceptions were made. Nobody makes money off what's on the archive, so people have been a little more flexible. And the archive worked very closely with Creative Commons and that approach to licensing intellectual property. <clears throat> and Brewster is a very effective uh, advocate for openness. Uh, and that's, I think, what's led to some of those exceptions. So you were not only um, you were not only doing the TV show. You are also kind of responsible for that well hype of video online because yes, uh, you had to part so. in that. And it really, it all started as I say with Computer Chronicles. Wow. That was the first model when we got all our shows online, and then then I spent three or four years working with the archive. We brought in eventually maybe a hundred other collections of film and video stuff. Wow. So, after all, do you consider yourself a pioneer in the computer industry? Uh, I'm not sure in the industry. I'm certainly a pioneer in the media of that industry. I mean, I never invented anything. But in terms of bringing this stuff to the general public and trying to explain it in a way that people could understand it, yeah, I think we were a pioneer. Uh, my big thing was to be kind of a United Nations translator. Mm. I mean, I think my skill was I could talk to a geek and I could talk to a normal person, and I can figure out how to get them to talk to each other. Hmm. And that was basically my job on the show. Hmm. I mean, some guy would come in, and he was all, you know, high-tech type stuff. And we have normal people watching who just want to solve a problem. Hmm. And so, yeah, I think we were a pioneer in developing that communication link between the, the geek community and the normal user community. Now, you said you are still interested in all the computer stuff and so on, and yeah. you keep current. So. Did you actually follow the careers of those people? For example, David, um, well, David Crane and all the yeah. other people. Did you follow them? Uh, I must say I haven't that much lately. Um, cer certainly while we were doing the show, I was sort of much more plugged in every day because we had mm. to I know all the stuff. Mm. <clears throat> I would say I'm not as plugged in now, but mm. uh, in, in certain areas, yes, but I think I've... I mean, when I go back and watch some of these old shows, I think, oh, yeah, I want to check mm -hmm. up on that, see what happened there. But so, no, I'm not, I'm not as plugged in right now as I'd like to be because I do a lot of other things now that are not computer technology related. Mm -hmm. So it takes a little bit of my, mm -hmm. my bandwidth away. Yeah, sure. But um, the question was more like, are you checking people on Wikipedia or kind of what they are doing nowadays? Are you interested in that? Oh, I'm definitely, I'm definitely interested. I'm not, I'm not interested, frankly, about the people, but about okay. what they're doing. Uh, so, as you say, I mean, people like Chuck Peddle, people who did interesting things 20 years ago, who are doing even interesting, interesting things now. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not a sort of fanboy of these, these, these guys, but uh, I'm a fan of the products and the technology. And the, mm -hmm. I mean, frankly, to me, the most exciting thing in the world is some new gadget. I mean, there's nothing more fun in life. <laughs> wow, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you are still into um, the new technology like argumented reality, like iPhones, iPads, smartphones. Mm. Yeah, we're waiting to see the new iPhone. Mm. The iPhone 6. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan of the bigger screen, so I'm glad they're going to wow. that. Big struggle between the, the, the Samsung 5 and the iPhone 4. That's true. That's true. So... But there's a long way to go there. I'm a, I'm a big mm. fan of wearables too, mm. uh, on the watch stuff. And matter of fact, I just gave away my Google Glass, which oh. I've been playing around with for a while. Ah, but but I have a Pebble watch. That's cool too. Watch. The Pebble. Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a watch nut. I have a whole collection of watches. Seriously. And, and uh, yeah, the Pebble is is pretty cool. I haven't quite I haven't quite gone to the Samsung watch yet, or the Casio with the Sony. Because uh, I think that's all changing very quickly right now. And again, I want to see what Apple's going to do in a couple of months. But uh, yeah, I actually have, I think I had the very first watch from 20, I don't know, two, three, four, five years ago mm. that interfaced with your cell phone. Mm. I mean, I remember showing people that when my cell phone rang, I got a message, I looked up here on my wrist. So it wasn't new to me. I, mean, I was there a long time ago. So um, let me ask you this. 
you you have been in touch with the computer history. What's yeah. your opinion about uh, Apple always claiming to be the first in the home computer business while, for example, I'm sure you read the book, Brian Becknell released in 2006, the book On the Edge, The Race yeah. of, and Fall of Commodore, where he yeah. actually made the standpoint that Commodore was the one with Jack Trammell to bring out the first affordable home computers for the masses instead of the glasses, which was also one of the statements Jack always repeated. Yes. Yes. So what's your opinion about that, about the wrong history? Uh, I think it's a very wrong history. Uh, Apple is brilliant at marketing and advertising and in design, but they didn't change the world. Com to this day, there are things that my Commodore Amiga does that nobody else can do. And it was doing it 20 years ago. I mean, I, I, was, I was a big fan of the game called Lemmings. Oh, yes. Nobody has duplicated what you could do with Lemmings on an old Amiga. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, Commodore was really, really a breakthrough. And unfortunately, I say, it wasn't, you know, they were back east in Westchester, Pennsylvania. They weren't part of the Silicon Valley culture. Uh, Jack Trammell didn't talk to these other Silicon Valley type guys. So you know, it sort of reminds me of the VHS beta war. I mean, beta was a better technology, but VHS one because it was VHS one because it was marketing, you know, better way to package the product. And I think it's the same thing. I mean, Commodore stuff was pretty cutting edge. Uh, but Apple is brilliant at selling and convincing people that their product is their advertising is brilliant now i mean i i use windows machines i use macs and i still have my old commodores uh believe me apple is not a superior product hmm. they do a very nice job they're very expensive and they've conned people into paying more for the same thing uh but i mean you know as i work on these two machines every day and I go crazy when I see these ads of these people saying, oh, the, the Mac is so much more reliable. <laughs> but you know, you can't even, it's so hard to look inside and know what's going on. Like, give, me my, give me a DOS machine. I know what the hell's happening in there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually a problem. You cannot expand it as well. And if they think it's outdated, they just get rid of interfaces of the Apple and stuff. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, Apple stole the interface from Xerox Park. So I mean, Apple didn't invent the, the graphic user interface or the mouse. They were very cleverly at stealing that idea and promoting it. Mm. But but isn't Microsoft told to do the same thing, stealing from other companies? Of course, everybody companies? does. But I mean, but, but Apple claims, oh, you know, we're the smartest guys on the planet. <laughs> you know, Microsoft doesn't claim they're the smartest guys on the planet. They're they're they're, they're better stealers than anybody else. But uh, yeah, there's. I mean, Apple has done a brilliant job of creating this myth around Mac products. I mean, Steve Jobs was part of that. He was a great salesman. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's uh, there's a little bit of discontinuity between the facts and what people think the facts are. Mm. Yeah, that's actually what I what I what I heard a lot when uh, talking to other people that marketing guys uh, made made up their own history, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Saying yeah. saying our company was the first but and they're, so on. But they're they're very good at it. I mean, Apple guys are very good at getting this. Cool. What 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 I heard from. Um, speaking to people in Commodore or other companies that the marketing department was always the one that made up history their own way like saying yeah. our company did this first right. and I did this first and so on so um, did I'll you give you one example yeah. of, of brilliant marketing there was enough you saw there was a documentary that was done a couple of years ago that we provided footage for called Mac heads no didn't, see that? didn't didn't do that Okay, there was a wonderful interview with this hot chick who's standing in line waiting to buy her latest uh, Apple product. Mm. And she says, you know, I couldn't sleep with a guy who uses Windows. <laughs> <laughs> that says it all. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, well, so all this hype is really not nonsense in a way. Right. So where do you think our computer life is going to? What's the next big thing? Well, robotics, I'm a big fan of robotics. So I think we're going to see intelligent things. I mean, the whole sort of, you know, wearable computers, hmm. and, you know, and uh, sort of the, the Internet of Things. I think that, that, that merge is going to be very important over the next couple of years. Uh, interfaces are still a big issue. Uh, how to talk to a machine and how a machine can talk back to you. Um, 
I think security is going to be increasingly an issue. Uh, people have just sort of surrendered control of their information. I don't think that's going to last forever. I think you can already see things starting. Facebook has got a couple of competitors coming in that are going to change that model. Uh, so there's going to be still a lot of interesting stuff going on. And I think the sort of the embedded chip, I mean, there's no question we're going to have a little chip in our brain, you know, 20 mm. years from now or something. But, but don't you think that's I mean, that's the ultimate scary? interface, right? Don't you think that's kind very of scary? scary. Very uh, scary. Yeah. Oh. yeah, because, I mean, who knows? But, I mean, the idea when you think, I mean, how far we've come where you can, I mean, just some of the learn, learning tools on computers now, I mean, how people are using computer technology for education. I mean, we're pretty close to that chip in the brain. I mean, you know, I've got on my phone college courses, you know, they're right there. So, I mean, it's not, not that far. And it's going to be from my phone to my wrist and from my wrist to my glasses and you know, who knows what else. Hmm. So, uh, it, it's like any piece of technology. I mean, it's good and bad. You know, most people don't think, but certainly in the, in the media field, in the computer field, a lot of technology was driven by pornography. Yeah, you don't think about you, that. You, because I, the I've most heard about that. Yeah. The first time around, you know, what sold videotape recorders? Pornography. <laughs> you know, what sold the internet? Pornography. So you never know how these things are going to work out. And eventually you, you figure it out in a better way. And actually the pornography industry is the one that made Blu-ray win against the yes, HD DVD. Exactly. <laughs> HD DVD, yeah. Exactly. That's the exactly. uh, most recent Porno story. Porno and high res, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, well, one little story and my question after it is, um, actually I did the interview with the inventor of um, Internet, um, Internet of Things. Adam Dankus, right. who, who's yeah. the Swedish guy who's known to be the inventor of that technology. Right. And um, actually to get him, I had to, I had to make phone calls to his sister and his yeah. wife all across Sweden, you know, Good for you. <laughs> to, to get him doing the uh, Skype video interview. And I wonder actually, um, was there one person you really wanted to have for the Chronicles shows and you had to move hell to get him for the show? Was there one of such guests? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think one of the hardest ones was Larry Ellison of Oracle. Mm. Uh, he's a pretty interesting character. And we tried to get with, I finally nailed him down once in Paris at a computer trade show and got to interview him. Uh, he's a pretty colorful guy. Uh, a lot of people hate him, but he's a pretty interesting guy. Uh, that that was a real a real uh, hit for us. I was really excited to finally get that. We tried for a long time. Um, of course, you know, I mean, Bill Gates. We I, I interviewed Gates many many times, and he's a really interesting, smart guy too. Um, that was a hard one. I mean, he was very very cooperative. Um, Trying to think who we really worked might have well Jack Trammell is another one. <laughs> uh, it was really hard to hard to get. Um, the other well another interesting guy we got you know Sergey Brin we I mean we had Sergey on our Net Cafe show before anybody had ever heard of Google. Mm. That that was a kind of big one that was kind of fun. Um, I guess there's there's some of the ones that would stand out. Mm. And what was the character that impressed you the most? I'll tell you a funny story. I'm not sure it's answered your question, but it's close. Uh, do you remember a company called Amdahl Computer? Not, not really, no. Okay, they made, they made minis at the time. There was a guy named Gene Amdahl, who was a brilliant, brilliant computer guy. All intellectual, I mean, very, very smart. And I had interviewed him some some time ago, and I I remember I mean, he was such a serious guy. I mean, he worked 24 hours a day. And I said, you know, what what do you do for fun in life? And he said, think. That's pretty good. So that's the beginning of the story. So here's this super intellectual, brainy guy, and he's an older guy. And we were at a, at a trade show in Las Vegas. And when you're at a trade show in Las Vegas, there's long lines for taxi cabs. So, you know, everybody's waiting, waiting, waiting to get a cab. And Gene was in line. Uh, I was close to him. Well, as he was about to get his cab, 
Some other guy just ran in front and stole the cab from him. Gene Amdo socked him. Here was this pure brain intellectual guy who all of a sudden was a fighter. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. I, the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. I don't think this guy ever had said a nasty word in his life. He didn't know socked the guy. <laughs> but he had the sense of what's mm. right, what's fair. You, know? mm. you mentioned earlier that um, some, some shows were really hard to make because the topic was so boring. What do you think, if the question is allowed, what do you think was the most boring, most boring show or situation? Well, you know, operating systems, microprocessors, that kind of stuff. And it's really important, but it's hard to make that interesting. I mean, there's an OS2 battle against Windows. And I'll tell you a funny story about that, by the way. We had a guy on from Microsoft when, you know, Microsoft was, was battling IBM for the operating system. And this one, OS2, was still sort of burgeoning there. Nobody knew who was going to sort of win this battle for the non-Apple uh, world. And this guy from uh, Microsoft says on the show, of course, Windows is just a temporary solution. The future of computing is OS2. Ooh. Ooh. Yes, I have that on tape. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Uh, actually, to say, I heard that OS2 is still used in some banks and some... I believe it is. Yeah. I believe it is, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that's another interesting question. What's your take on that? I mean, you see, now we have um, one of the last shows actually was about Windows XP, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. It was about the introduction of Windows XP. And the big topic this year was the, the stop of support for Windows XP in April. Right. And as you know, the embedded machines like the ATMs are still supported for three sure. years for the right. for the security uh, updates. Why right. do you think that in some areas the technology development never really went on? I mean, that's really really incredible. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. There's a lot of possible answers to that. I mean, frankly, I thought Windows XP was a pretty good operating system. I mean. That's why people still use it. I mean, it's pretty stable. It's pretty good. Uh, and there might be economic issues there. I mean, what's the cost of upgrading and how much do you get for it versus what you in, invested in and so on. I think the Microsoft decision to so visibly announce it's stopping support for XP, I think was a mistake. Um, I mean, I Apple has done a very a good job at that. In which, you, know, the, the, you know, you get all these upgrades for nothing and here's... Microsoft saying, oh, by the way, we don't care about all these people who supported us for all those years. I, and there's, frankly, a lot of scams going on right now about that. I have a friend just called me a couple days ago. Well, somebody called me saying they were from Microsoft and saying that, you know, because there was no more support from XP, I'm going to have a lot of problems with my computer, but for $150, they'll fix it for me. Hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of nasty stuff going on, I think, with, with the dropping of support for XP. Uh, but, frankly... I mean, if you really know what's going on, what the hell do you need support for XP for? You know, hmm. it's not that important. Hmm. So I mean, I don't, I don't see what they gain from that, from what Microsoft gained from doing that. Microsoft's be, going to become a very different company now that with new leadership there. Hmm. Hmm. In which way you think the company changed? Well, kind of, and to some degree, the way Apple has changed. When you have a really uh, iconic leader like a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs. That really defines the company, and that personality defines the approach that company takes to its customers. Uh, when Steve Jobs left Apple, it's a different Apple. Uh, when Bill Gates, even Steve Ballmer was not a Bill Gates. Mm. When Bill Gates left Microsoft, it sort of lost its way a little bit. I mean, Gates was an extremely smart, open-minded guy. Um, and so I, I think when you lose that, that early leadership, things, things change a little bit. So I think, you know, Apple's not the same it used to be. Microsoft won't be the same it used to be. I mean, that's what I find so interesting about Oracle. They still got Larry Ellison there. I mean, he's, he's really a dinosaur. But he's, he still, you know, rules that place with an iron hand. Um, so, yeah, I, I, think, I think going from a more corporate normal structure from the old original maniacal founder makes a big difference in a company. I mean, obviously, Steve Jobs was brilliant in that he paid attention to detail, as Jack Trammell was. Mm. I mean, the gripe about Jack was he made every single decision. 
That was considered a bonus if you're called Steve Jobs, but a problem if you're called Jack Trammell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. That's kind of interesting. So, so you think you think with Tom with Tom Cook's um, doing doing Apple now and and the new uh, Indian guy doing Microsoft, yeah. the companies are going on a downhill path. I wouldn't say downhill necessarily, but the the passion for innovation I don't think is the same. Uh, and frankly, I saw this happen with Google. You know, when Google started out and was a private company, you know, they had their motto, do no evil and all that stuff. Hmm. They were a pretty fun, interesting company. Once they were worth billions of dollars, that company changed. Hmm. Uh, you know, they went from being some really smart graduate students at Stanford, just being another Wall Street company. And that you just see that evolution changing a lot of these, these, these companies. Hmm. Uh, I think, you know, Google is, is another good example. You know, whether it'll happen to some of these other really newy webby type companies, the, the Facebooks and all that, I, I don't know. Hmm. But I think there's still a lot to be proven uh, in social media too. I mean, hmm. that's that's a really interesting business model. Hmm. Uh, and again, there's just this two new guys that just started Facebook type sites, and what they're going to offer to pay people who post information on there, claiming that hey, Facebook's got the greatest racket in the world. Everybody provides them their content for free. Not too many businesses like that around. So I think then the social media thing may get, may get kind of interesting. Not only from the security point of view I mentioned earlier, but from the, the trouble is a lot of people just are so excited about seeing their name online that they're willing to give it away. Uh, I think that may fade after a while. The, the, the big thrill of knowing that everybody's a publisher may fade away when you can see the downside of everybody having access to all your information. That could be the second um, dot-com bubble, in a way. Yes, absolutely. Abs absolutely, I think so. Uh, and I may not, I think it, it's going to happen. I'm not sure when. But uh, the trouble is with, with all the sort of social media stuff and all the Internet stuff, it is so fragile. It's so easy for a user to change. You don't have to go in the store and bring home a heavy box. You press a button, and you're using somebody <laughs> else. You know, you're using Amazon instead of this guy, or, or or Bing instead of Google, or whatever. The the barrier to entry for competitors is so low. It's not like physical stuff. You know, if you're going to change from you know driving an Audi to driving a Volkswagen, that's a big decision. Uh, in the in the virtual world, in the internet world, in the software world, it's so easy to be uh, unfaithful. And I think that's a risk these companies have to face. So, but on the other side, you have you have things like Second World and so on, where people actually invest money to have um, to have a yard and a house in a which Second Life, a, yeah, Second Life, for example, where people actually buy with hard money, like houses on a virtual ground, or um, what's the other one? Um, I forgot that name. The the game that is the out of blocky boxes. Yeah, yes, 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 I know what you mean, yeah, yeah. Well, that's crazy to me. I, I mean, I, I have friends who make a lot of money selling nothing on uh, in Second Life or in the whatever that other one's called. Uh, I don't get that. Um, it's pretty fast. I mean, apart from the technology, all of this stuff is fascinating from a sociological point of view. I mean, how human beings are interacting with the technology and willingness to surrender so much uh, is really, really interesting. So, do you think that um, the amount of innovators will be smaller? There will be less people like Shaq Padalo, whoever made things happen back yeah. then, like 30 years ago? I think so, unless there's a whole new category comes about. I mean, obviously, the, you know, the Internet was different from traditional hardware and software. That allowed new people in. If we get into them, whatever it is, some other new world of interfaces or embedded chips or something, uh, you'll have a new innovation. But right now, the business is sort of locked down in many ways. So I think mm -hmm. it's and, – and the barriers to entry are, are higher in many fields because uh, even on the Internet business, I mean – You know, six, seven years ago, you could start a website for nothing. But now you've got to spend $10 million in promotion. 
you know, just to get enough critical mass so that you can prove to advertisers that it's worth it. Um, that's that's certainly harder, a lot harder to do right now. I'm I'm working with one group in Los Angeles right now that's trying to do that, and uh, I mean, if they win, if if they're successful, it's a, it's a huge win. But the odds against breaking through all the entrenched, powerful forces right now are pretty difficult. Uh, I, I think it's kind of sad in a way. I mean, again, I remember you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was really exciting. I mean, everybody and their brother was inventing something, coming up with some new product, some idea. And there, were, there, was, there, uh, there was, I think, maybe more opportunity then. I think the app world is maybe different because hmm. that's still relatively low cost of entry, but also the competition is ridiculous. I mean, you write an app, you're one of 10 million guys trying to sell that app. So unless you're really, really lucky and you get sort of um, good viral stuff going, it's, it's a hard business. But nowadays, everybody can be a pioneer. Let's let's have a look at this uh, Vietnamese guy who did Flappy Bird. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, if you if you if you got something really clever and you're lucky and uh, you you can merchandise it, that that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, there, are, there. So the world is a big place. Is the good news, and in the interconnected world, the whole globe is your marketplace. So you can make a lot of money on a little idea because it's so easy to deliver. You don't have to put it in a box and mail it anywhere. It's all virtual. So, yeah, I think from that point of view, it's a lot easier than it used to be. Uh, but it's very, very competitive. Again, I mean, the app world is insane. You think about it. I always think it's so funny that, you know, the Apple brags, we have over a million apps in the App Store. Who needs a million apps? Right? I mean, just confusing. I, I, I want the hundred apps. I don't want a million apps. <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of these silly things. Hmm. It's, it's it's very good Apple marketing. How about uh, how about new industry fields? How about new groups? For example, elderies. I mean, there are still a lot of people like 60, 70 plus who who are scared to use a smartphone and stuff. I mean, if I look around, who uses a smartphone? It's Either people who are pioneers and ever have ever always have been tinkering around with new stuff like yourself, but but people let's say above fifty or something they would try to well the 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 hardest thing they ever used was a television. <laughs> um, do you think <laughs> do you think there is the future or maybe there is a way to make new technology more comfortable for for people of higher age groups? That's a really interesting question. In fact, we were playing with putting together a show uh, just for that very group of people. It was called Digital Seniors and trying to help people over 60 years old or whatever not be intimidated by the technology or by their grandchildren who understand it and they don't. Um, yeah, that's, I, I don't, I think that's changing though. I mean, I think people who used to be afraid of smartphones They may not be really good at it, but you kind of have to have it right now. You look at the just numbers came out of China a week or two ago that more people are accessing the web on a smartphone than on a computer. I mean, that's phenomenal. So I, I think it's kind of hard to live in this. I mean, there were people who were afraid of computers 10 years ago. You can't be afraid of a smartphone these days. You're out of it, I think. And I mean, the smartphone, it's not a smartphone. It's everything, right? I mean, you know, I mean... I remember doing research when I was a student. Oh, what a nightmare that was, right? In the library at 2 o'clock in the morning, pulling things up. It's so easy to do everything right now. All that knowledge is right in your pocket. How can, you can't ignore that. I mean, you're going to get walked over. So you, you, think, you think it's wrong that elderly people are afraid of new technology? In some I don't way. think it's wrong. I mean, I can understand it. I mean, I, I look at you know, people I know, family, friends, and so on. Uh, it's, it is intimidating and they're, it's kind of tough. I think when you're 50, 60 years old and your 15 year old grandson knows more than you do. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a tough thing. I think psychologically to face up to, uh, and it takes a certain mental dexterity to adjust these things. It's really interesting. I, it's kind of, it's funny. Sometimes somebody will be working on a computer problem and say, can you help me? Well, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I just understand the language and the way of thinking. I say, well, let's try this. That'll probably work. How did you know that? I don't know. It's just in my DNA. I just live in that world. So, I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to explain. Uh, but there's some people just weren't raised that way. 
so I think yeah, the problem with some of the people who are older, they're just they're not digital people. They're not they, they weren't surrounded by all this stuff. So that it's a certain way of thinking uh, in terms of the way things work. I, I mean, it happens to me many times. I mean, I'll go to solve a problem. They say, "How do you know how to do this?" I have no idea. It just <laughs> I just know. <laughs> this means, on the other hand, that in 20, 30 years, this problem will be totally faded away because yes. everybody that is younger now will be older yes. than and so like, oh, new technology. But who knows what the next new thing will be, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the next thing will be telepathy or something, you know, and you're going to read other people's minds <laughs> and be afraid of that. And that's probably next. <laughs> but but still, since you since you learned in comparison to the generation before, I think every generation is like thirty years. Yeah. And um, then um, you learned how to how to adjust to new technology. It should be easier for us in a way. Anyway. Yes. Even though yeah. even though if the next big thing is like something we can't imagine now, I mean nowadays. 3D printing is to be is trying to be the next big thing. Right, right, right. Like a replicator from Star Trek. Sure, sure, sure. But I mean that's I mean that's I'm I'm fascinated by the 3D printing business, but I mean that's that's not complicated in a way that some of these other things are. I mean, you press a button and you get 3D instead of 2D. Uh I think it's more of the the software kind of things, the communications kinds of things that people will find or even I mean, even just the, the social media stuff. I mean, that's scary for a lot of older people too. Uh, and that, I mean, that's that's an interesting problem too, in terms of young people want to be in their world, and the older people want to be in their world. And there's certain discomfort in having your parents on knowing, you know, being a Facebook friend. Uh, that's another one of these issues. That you really want everybody in the world to know what you're doing. Uh, that, that that's really interesting. So it's not technology, but sociology. It's really interesting, it seems to me. That's and you know, from a law point of view, there are very many interesting cases. I'll give you one. There was a woman, and I think it was in Indiana, in the United States, who uh, I think she was involved in some car accident and ran over some guy. And during the uh, during the trial, one of the pieces of evidence that the lawyer brought up was pictures from her Facebook showing her drinking. You know, just sort of throwing stuff down her throat. And that was evidence that the jury helped the jury convince then that she was alcoholic and that she was guilty, responsible for this accident. She never thought when she put that picture up on Facebook, this would be fun for her friends. This was hurting her. This was a piece of evidence. I mean, it happens with people looking for jobs right now. Uh, <clears throat> and there's, there's another interesting legal case like that, too. There was an, another trial going on somewhere in the United States, and the judge in that trial created a pseudonym on Facebook and was writing every night about what was going on in the trial. It was totally improper, totally unethical. But, you know, like you know, the old early line and, you know, on the Internet, they don't know you're a dog. I mean, you can hide so easily on the Internet and, and, and be false. Uh, there's, there's some real interesting problems with this. Uh, explosion of information and access information. These are complicated subjects for belonging to PhD thesis, but they're interesting. How do you protect yourself from that? I mean, you are a known figure. It it took me ten seconds to find you. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's an interesting question. There's this whole sort of reputation thing. I mean, people can put anything they want up online, right? And I'll give you one example. Uh, I, I never Google myself because I find it very annoying, embarrassing. But I was trying to show somebody how you can find people online. And I said, oh, well, you know, put yourself in. And one of the first comments I saw was, Stuart Chaffee is the most hated man in America. Seriously? Ooh. Seriously. What the hell is that about? Because they really didn't like that I interrupted guests on the show and didn't let them keep on talking. So, you know, people, all of a sudden, this is my reputation. So it's, it's a different world. I mean, in the, in the old days, you had a little circle of friends, and you knew them, and you talked to them, and you saw them face to face. It's, we're going to have to, a lot of adjusting to do in this, this new totally, totally interconnected earth. <laughs> so you think it's a big chance to, to have this global thing, but also dangerous because everything is so open? It's wonderful, and it's awful, yeah. I mean, it's it's like I said, like any new technology. Uh, I mean, you know, 
Nuclear weapons. I mean, it's a great invention, but it could kill everybody on the planet. Depends on what you do with it. I think it's the same thing with any any computer or digital technology. Um, and it's just it's, it's, a, it's easy to do this stuff, or even just you know all the hacking that goes on. I mean, China stealing American trade secrets and the Russians. I mean, that's another thing. I mean, this whole sort of computer espionage field is really wild to think about. But I mean, people can break into stuff. Uh, I mean, and, and you would think there are things you think would be so secure, but there's a lot of smart hackers out there, and you know. You know, certainly the United States government has found, Germany has found, <laughs> that the United States can listen in on, uh, on Merkel. <laughs> yeah, cancel us phone being, uh, being um, spied on and stuff. All yeah, that was yeah. kind of a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. That was a scandal. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. So if you restart the Computer Chronicles someday, who would be the big guy you would interview next? Mark Zuckerberg. Seriously, Facebook. Hey, what they've done is phenomenal. I mean, they own the world. They own everybody's information. I mean, they're they're more important than Google in a way, or certainly than any hardware company. I mean, the Facebook thing is absolutely amazing to me. And they have. I mean, you heard some of the recent scandal about they they ran this little phony psychological test among their oh, users. Oh yes, I heard about that. I mean. Facebook has so much potential power now. They control so much information. Uh, yeah, I'd, I, I've never talked to him yet, but that would be a pretty damn interesting conversation. So, on one hand, you scare him. On the other, on the other hand, you look up to him because he made such a a, a fascinating product. Uh, yeah, just I mean, it's been the theme of everything we've been talking about. There's the good and the bad to all of this. Yeah, I mean, what Zuckerberg did is brilliant. Um, but having all that information out in the open really raises some, some social issues. <laughs> and, you know, it's a question of how ethical... The trouble is, it's the same thing I mentioned with Google. I mean, when you start out, you're all very high-minded and, and high-principled and we're going to make the world a better place. But then there's a lot of money involved. <laughs> And people get tempted to do bad things because they can make money doing it. And when you control a lot of information, there's a lot of bad things you can do. <laughs> so the next, my my next question that just came up was, actually, how did how did the IT industry pioneer guys um, happen to, well, to split up in A, B, C, V, I, P, for example? It's it's no problem to to talk to David Crane or something. To, you mm -hmm. can contact him, no problem. But for example, Steve Wozniak, I tried to contact Steve Wozniak, but I was told that he's booked out for years because he's such yeah. a great guy. How how did that happen? How did a person reach so much fame in the computer world? How has that happened? Be because of the millions that they made? Hard to imagine. No, I just don't think it's good. I mean, Wozniak is an iconic character in his business, obviously. I mean, Steve Jobs was not the techie. Wozniak was the techie. Jobs was the, the marketer. Uh, and that's not true. I mean, I, I, Wozniak shows up all the time. But, I mean, yeah, he's, he's a hot property and people want him and he works for nothing, basically, so he has to budget his time. And he does lots of good things. Uh, But yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of A-list and B-list. I mean, David Crane is a big guy to you and me, but he's not a big guy to a lot of people. Steve Wozniak is a big guy to everybody in the world. But he got he got his award four years ago um, yeah. for his achievement. So yeah. he is a big guy in some way. Uh, he is, but I mean, it's a different it's a different category. Sure, I mean, to to us who I mean, say the average guy in the street, say you know David Crane. Now, who's David Crane? We know it because we live in that world. Say who's Steve Wozniak? Oh, he's the Apple guy. So it's just a different, different law. And I mean, these guys aren't a minute. And after a while, they get pretty big egos, you know. Um, and frankly, from a practical point of view, they, they can't say yes to everybody who wants a piece of them. So that, that doesn't bother me that much. But I mean, David, and also, I mean, Crane was like a normal guy, you know. I think he can identify more with 
somebody like you or, or me who asks him for something. Uh, he hasn't lived in that upper echelon of Apple or IBM or Microsoft. So we have those two categories, those media iconic people. Right. That everybody wants to talk to and people who were still big and pioneers, but weren't so iconic. But there's a third, a third um, person. Let's make an example. If you go to the people on the street, um, I tried this on my mom or my friends or whatever, who, who are not into computers. And I name the person Alexei Pechetnov. Then about the half of the people will say, wasn't there this mind puzzle game somewhere on the Game <laughs> Boy? So, so uh, some people seem to know that he is the Tetris inventor, but not all. But as soon but as you hear it, Tetris is pretty famous. I mean, I mean anybody who lived through those early game days knows. I mean, I still have Tetris on my iPhone. So, <laughs> so, um, so that's the third third generation. Yeah. He, yeah. that he's a person he is he is um recognized by the game he did on a soviet country where yeah. there, there were there was no freedom right and he was not paid until 1995 right. so that's like if you are if you are a little small guy but you made a fun thing like tetris you can also be a yes. vip so sure. well, i mean Tetris is, I mean, one of the most iconic games there is. You know, you mentioned Angry Birds. I mean, there's certain things that are just big, big, big around the world. And I don't, I don't think it's necessarily related to money. Uh, it's just everybody knows them. That's I mean, uh, David Crane, I'm guessing, didn't make a fortune of money on all the stuff he did. Um, but I, I'm not sure that's the issue. But I think, when you, again, when you go back to my Google example, when a company goes public, and people literally make billions of dollars. It just changes the whole the whole deal. I'm gonna to have to go in a couple of minutes, Jörg, no just problem. so you know. No problem. Oh, you you know how to pronounce my name, Jörg? Uh, actually, I've worked with a guy named Jörg, yeah. Wow, because most people say George. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well. Well, actually, yeah, it was one of my last questions, so no problems about that. Um, Okay. Yes. Well, so it's very interesting. Yeah, um, nice talking with you. Very interesting discussion. Well, so thank you for for the interview. Your pleasure talking with you. Very, very interesting discussion. Thank you. I hope we can keep in touch and you let me of know course. if the Computer Chronicle project really goes on. Yes. Uh, may, maybe we could maybe we could reinvite you if you ever make this thing happening again for Absolutely. the podcast we are doing. Of Absolutely. Course, now we started a podcast too, though. That would course, be a possibility course. if you want to talk about your reinvented computer chronicles. Okay, okay, sounds good. Good. So thank you. All right, nice being with you. Yeah, see you. Bye. Bye, Jorg. Bye. <laughs>